I'm Beth Naylor. I teach in the nutrition department here. I've been here uh, for a long time. I'm sure longer than any of you, uh, since 1978. And as Brian Kelly said yesterday in their uh, sustainability presentation, I have maybe 16 hours of material to cover in the next 50 minutes. So I am just going to breeze through this. So this is designed to be a photo overview, I've got many slides here, but they're um, entirely photographs, and it's designed to be sort of a springboard, not to uh, explain everything about all the issues surrounding local food, but to give you maybe a springboard for further discussions among family, friends, uh, uh, classes, um, so a springboard. My life changed a few days after this in 1983. Um, uh, uh, my first and only child, for one thing, I didn't knit for a while. But one thing that happened was I was randomly put into a Bertha Three group with Mary Jo Wade, and she and her husband, and I think still at that time they had two other co-owners in the farm um, Wintergreen, Wintergreen Farm near No Tie, and um, it is a still functioning organic farm, you know, um, 30 years later. And this was my introduction to the life of a farmer. I come from a family of educators, um, uh, store owners, and so I didn't have anybody in my family with a farming background. So this was my chance to learn about what, a, what hard work that is, being a farmer, how unpredictable it is. And so I really uh, enjoyed getting to know her and to learn more about uh, farming. My uh, background is nutrition, um, and so I really liked um, learning about um, the connection to it, and it just um, started a long-term interest in me in local food. There are times when eating locally grown food makes total sense. It's uh, fresh, you know, that the food didn't have to uh, travel thousands of miles to get here, and since it's fresh, it has more nutrients, and it feels so good to be connected in some way to the food you're eating. But there are times when eating locally doesn't make sense. And um, Dean, in the classroom, Dean or Randy, um, could these lights in the front of the building be uh, brought down just a little bit? I'm not sure that's possible in this room. But as you can, uh, on the lower left of this, those are Euphoria chocolate buttons. <laughs> and we don't have cocoa trees in <laughs> Lane County. But at, hey, thank you guys. But at least um, the buttons are made here. <laughs> Another of my daily pleasures is coffee. Again, <laughs> doesn't grow here. But at least we can uh, roast the beans locally. The Wintergreen Farm has a CSA. And we are, have been members of a number of CSAs over the years but uh, we're members of Wintergreen now, and this was their fall harvest. And with the CSA, I think um, a number of you probably are members of a CSA. You pick up the harvest at a, a drop-off site. And um, our drop-off site is extremely convenient. I look at it when I'm sitting on our front porch every night. <laughs> and. Um, it gives us, everybody involved, uh, it gives us great pleasure. And I know because it's so delicious and enjoyable to get that, I know we eat better, the families who are members of it. Their uh, CSAs usually have activities where you can be in, involved in the life of the farm. And I have mean to ask our CSA, what are those? corn kernels. Mm -hmm. 
another way to get locally grown food are farmers markets. It's not the only way. Springfield is in a different location now, but I love this location in downtown Springfield. Where's they, it, where's it now? Where it's now um, uh, right by the library in downtown Springfield. And it's nice. I, I went a few weeks ago, but it's still, it's not quite under the dark area by the Springfield Library. It's uh, more open, and it really is very, very pleasant. But they are uh, starting a year-round farmer's market at this uh, Christian church at 4th and A. And Wendy and I visited there this summer to see their progress. It's been um, sort of fits and starts getting it going. They had some code things that they had to work out, but it is set to open in October, and I'm really excited about um, how that's gonna look. They have a really nice outdoor courtyard. Another part they're going to have um, is a incubator kitchen where if a uh, business is trying to develop a new product, they can experiment in a certified kitchen to bring that uh, product to market. And this is a, a local Springfield, or Springfield organization that is uh, spearheading the farmer's market. Another way to get local food besides going to a farmer's market uh, is online. And this one, the, the pickup spot is in South Eugene at Yamazis. And a student in um, one of our nutrition classes sent us this picture. Downtown Eugene is um, a popular site. Those are, they call those cauliflower, cheddar cauliflower. Um, Sandy Jensen and her husband, uh, Peter, were just telling me yesterday, they have a CSA from Groundwork, Groundwork's farm. Local food is uh, sometimes more expensive. Uh, small local farmers lack the economy of scale of big farmers, big farms. They, one of the reasons they're more expensive sometimes is that they consider the long-term environmental costs of their farming practices and not just the, the short-term um, cost of a product, of, of a crop. They use uh, often just accountable labor conditions that um, sometimes add to the, the cost. I mean, if a farm is doing the sort of slave conditions we've heard of of the tomato farms in uh, southern Florida, <coughs> you know, it would be hard to, for a, a person doing that to look their neighbors in the eye if they were doing, um, having those sorts of uh, farm conditions. And so these accountable farming practices sometimes add to the cost. But there are efforts, I mean, I'm a nutritionist, I understand, everybody understands that we're healthier when we eat lots of fruits and vegetables. And it's really a problem when they're more expensive than a 64 ounce fountain soft drink at a, a convenience store. I mean, it's just really too bad. And uh, so there are efforts being um, made across the country to try to make fruits and vegetables more um, affordable. And now, a, as a result of a USDA grant, farmers markets all over the country have these swipe machines where electronic benefit cards can be swiped. And you know, it's at one location at that um, farmers market at you know just one spot there is where it's swiped. It's not at every vendor, but once it's swiped, what you get are tokens. And you then can take those tokens to, the, uh, to a vendor to pay for your food. Uh, at the Springfield Farmer's Market, they have gotten uh, uh, matches so that they 
are able to supply five dollars of extra tokens i think it's for every fifteen dollars that you swipe your card for they will give you twenty dollars worth of tokens there is also a program a nationwide program to supply double tokens and there's only on their map it's all, it's called the wholesome wave uh, program and i only saw one farmers market in oregon that uh, uh, subscribes to that program and that was in forest grove but i've talked to people in this area to um, try to encourage participation in a program like that you also can get farmers market coupons through WIC. those um, are there's not many of them and it's not a lot of money, but at least it's a start. And you're, you get a coupon like this. And they're available also at Senior and Disabled Services. And what you look for when you're at a market is a vendor displaying this, that they are an approved uh, provider of, of these coupons. And it's there at the Springfield Farmers Market. I only saw one of these signs. It's not a big market, but um, it's um, it's hard to find uh, uh, farmers who go through the process to become approved by this sort of thing. And in the Eugene Market, it, I mean, it's so crowded now on the, on Saturdays that you know I didn't see those signs anywhere. But it's, it's something to keep working toward participation, um, availability of these sorts of things. The uh, Eugene Farmer's Market, this is when a, on a Tuesday when it isn't as crowded. And the one thing I love about that location is it's the same location as in the early 1900s. And that continuity, you know, I just really enjoy. And I learned about that from um, this really fun book. Just a small, easy to read uh, book that's available in, uh, this was the Eugene Library, but it's available in a number of different uh, libraries. And it's just fun seeing the perspective of, I mean, this is sort of my people. I mean, I graduated from high school in 1968, so I really like uh, reading things from this perspective farmers markets all over. And this was a sign I saw for a farmers market in Benita. And there is an Oregon Farmers Market Association that um, has them all listed. Um, another way to find out about locally grown food is this guide put out by the Willamette Farm and Food Coalition. And it, you can search it different ways. I like to search just uh, at looking at the whole list of farms. And uh, Hensi uh, Family Farm is one that uh, students are always telling us they really enjoy going to. And this guy tells what products are available, and this is one of the di most diverse farms as far as availability. Uh, they explain their farming practices, whether they're organic or not, and uh, this Hensi is not organic, but they use a lot of sustainable practices. And they also tell where they sell at. And if they have financial assistance programs. This is the most well-known um, activity of Willamette Farm and Food Coalition, but it is not the only one and our own uh, Lisa Heron is on the board. She's um, uh, taking her students on a tour of Deck Family Farm, which is our favorite place to get meat. It's um, near uh, Junction City. And um, they're preparing for their 100-mile meal that, they, that the culinary students do in the spring, which is a wonderful exercise to learn about what does grow here. You know, like I said, you don't want to always live with a hundred mile. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to stop my coffee or my um, uh, chocolate or my coconut milk that I like now and then. But it is really a wonderful uh, experience to learn what does grow here. I mean, it's. I mean, we're 
we're just so, we just have so much that grows here. And the Willamette Farm Co uh, and Food Coalition, their office is in the Grover's Market building, which is down by the train station. And I, again, I mean, these are, are my people. This is my time in the Grover's Market. It is still there and looks the same when you go in there. And it's a, a, a really great way to, um, again, look for um, affordably, more affordably priced. I mean, you are involved when you're buying from Gover's Market. I mean, there are, are participants. Should we go back to the Titus now then? Yes. And this, you know, you, you, I mean, they do have a website. I mean, they don't look like they would have a website, <laughs> but they do. And. Um, uh, they, they would keep you updated. I mean, I took this uh, picture several years ago, so um, you know, I don't know if this is exactly their hours now. <coughs> and this is another um, important activity of the Willamette Farm and Food Coalition. They also, um, with uh, in, in partnership with others, uh, are helping with the uh, bean and grain project and you know we talk a lot about the fruits and vegetables uh, growing here but there is a, a, a trying to return to growing more staple foods here too not just the, the uh, summer and fall crops we have a, a, a CSA from them too they're beautiful uh, good tasting beans notice I have these earrings on mm -hmm. and um, they're mentioned at the end of this book that just came out um, spring or summer which is really a wonderful hope she she calls herself hope raking she goes around the country looking at, at things that give us hope about our food system yesterday at the sustainability breakout session Brian and Jennifer and Claudia were uh, uh, talking about sustainability, looking at systems and patterns, and um, that's what she does in this book. And it's uh, such a good read. I really enjoyed it. And at the very end, it mentions Lonesome Whistle Farm and another farm I'll talk about um, in a little bit. But uh, Red, the Register Guard did a two-page, well-written article about this farm that um, it was just wonderful. And in addition to the beans, they also grow wheat. And wheat um, used to be, uh, well, and it's still, there is a lot of wheat grown here, but we as local people didn't get access to a lot of that wheat. It was uh, grown for export. But now there are small farms growing it for local consumption like Sweet Home Farm, I mean uh, Open Oak Farm in Sweet Home, that's wheat. And they have a company uh, called Adaptive Seeds where they're uh, trying to, to bring back more uh, seed variety. And I'll mention them um, uh, in a, in a later on. And in this National Geographic article, they uh, talk about how in um, uh, 1903, there were 307 varieties of corn. And now if you look at the bottom, there are 12. I mean, uh, commonly, commonly grown uh, uh, corn, varieties of corn. And there is a, quite a, a serious move to return back to more uh, uh, seed diversity. And what we're doing here is uh, being noticed on the national scene. This was a Smithsonian article. It says from uh, New England to the Northwest, but one of the farmers they mentioned is a, a local grass seed farmer that wanted to uh, grow food and has uh, changed from uh, grass seed to wheat and other grains. And just, um, I believe it was this past year, um, uh, brought into operation after, it, it took a while to bring this to operation, but it's a flour mill um, out uh, by the airport. It's called Camas Country Mill. 
And um, I, I love the name of uh, Camas Country because Camas was a staple crop here. Um, I mean, a staple, uh, not a crop, I mean, it was uh, gathered of the Kalapuya Indians in our area. Beth, do you know where they sell that wheat? We, um, you see it around, I'll show a sticker for um, what you can see, uh, identify bread, um, but um, they sell it right there, I mean, they have it, but it's um, more, uh, becoming more widely available. I mean, that's, I think, the next step in the process is uh, uh, bringing it more widely available. And uh, camas bulbs, when I uh, talk about this in class, I've had students tell me they uh, took Gail Baker's class and learned that it's very, you need to do this very carefully if you're trying to uh, harvest ca camas bulbs because some of them are poisonous. And everywhere I uh, uh, hear about the uh, Kalapuya Indians, um, Esther Stutzman's name is mentioned. And this is the sticker you can look for if you're looking for uh, this uh, locally grown uh, uh, flower. They also uh, uh, grow teff. And uh, Tom Hutton does, and, and other farmers. And it's a very uh, protein rich uh, grain that I use to make polenta. And Karen Gilliman is a UO biology, a University of Oregon biology faculty, who um, has a website. She blogs at the uh, Fairmount uh, neighborhood farmers market site. And she has lots of. Um, step-by-step step with photo uh, uh, directions for using whole whole grains and beans for the, 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 the local ones. And then other things, but I've really focused on her, the beans and grains she uses. And I mean, she's, she's an artist. I mean, she's, uh, her photographs are just wonderful. She took, she made this, she took this photo. Um, I, I really like her site. And local beans and grains, uh, Food for Lane County is now um, putting into their food boxes a chili mix with local beans and grains. Another way to um, uh, make local foods more uh, affordable, Hummingbird Wholesale, which is a wonderful um, gene company that um, ha has a fill your pantry sale once, maybe twice a year, where you can go buy um, grains in bulk for uh, a lower price. Hummingbird usually supplies bulk things to stores, um, but they do this, um, the sale that our culinary program uh, really helps with this. I've learned about um, especially local beans and grains from Dan Armstrong, who has a website called Mud City Press, and some of the things, like I'll talk at the end about a food analysis uh, document that he has a, a, a link for that at his website. Another way to make local foods affordable is you picking. We, uh, when my daughter was young, we would you pick strawberries at CB Loop. And I love reading about CB Loop um, as being a supplier of hops back in the early part of the 1900s, Oregon was the main supplier of uh, hops for the, the, national, the national beer industry. And I love thinking about us, you know, uh, doing that. They would have hop encampments there in CB Loop where pickers would come and um, harvest the hops and, and camp out. And I found these photos on that uh, really nice book that the Register Guard did a whole series of uh, these books. Another uh, fun thing in, in the fall, kids love going in and picking, um, uh, getting their own pumpkin. There's been a real interest, a resurging interest, interest, interest in gardening 
which I think is wonderful. This is a, a book the library now owns, just published um, spring and, and uh, the spring or the summer. Um, and you know, as a nutritionist, I'm so grateful that Michelle Obama has taken on the um, the her move on uh, or not move on. Uh, that's something different. Uh, <laughs> let's move. Um, uh, Let's move. Let's move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and this is a, a, a just a wonderful book about um, uh, White House gardens, but gardens in general. Uh, this is a friend salad that she brought. That everything there was grown in her garden. Kale is a wonderful item to grow around here. It's almost year round, and it's so nutritious, and um, oh, excuse me, lots of interesting ways to do it. And it's so rewarding to harvest a green vegetable in the uh, cold of winter. Lots of ways to find garden space in in uh, unusual <coughs> places, and this is the extent of um, my gardening. Oops. Um, you can also, um, it's not just fruits and vegetables. There's a, a again, a growing interest in um, animals. I mean, this is, uh, was in the register guard. And so I don't know if the <coughs> lights changed that made it sort of hard to read some of that. You can't, in urban areas, uh, by law, in, in Eugene, I don't think you can have this many chickens. I think people do have more than two, um, and people don't necessarily. Three, I mean, in, in Springfield it, or Eugene, it's three? The last it's I it's Springfield, it's three. Yeah, I mean, they don't want roosters, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, you know, our neighbors had um, chickens, and I would love being out there when they came for their food. I mean, it's it's the most uh, gentle, uh, warm sound. Those chickens just stay and feed me. Um, and Roxanne was just telling Roxanne Watson, our our uh, person who organized all of this, uh, was just telling me yesterday they ha now have uh, chickens. Uh, they're not laying yet, but they also um, um, are ready for bees. And eggs, the uh, eggs that are, are free range, they're uh, often really pretty. I mean, depending on the chickens that you have, and um, oops, oops, and also very uh, nutritious. Chickens that are, are uh, grazing, are you able to feed freely, uh, make different nutrients. You can tell by the color. Um, that, that, that is a signal that there are really different nutrients there. Extremely uh, nutritious. Bees, another thing that um, urban farmers are doing. And our, our neighbor had uh, bees and they're feeding on our lavender and you know, it just makes the honey wonderful. There are community garden plots Eugene has um, six sites with uh, where people can can purchase uh, garden sites, and of those six sites, there are 300 plots in all, and the site costs anywhere from 60 to 100 dollars. There are waiting lists for them, but um, it uh, it's new. It's they're gettable. I mean, you can um, get them. Um, this is the Amazon uh, site in 2007, and that site looks different now. They're using that where, uh, as a drop-off site for leaves, and those leaves compost and make beautiful soil. And you don't have to have pay your 60 to $100 to get that soil, those leaves or that soil. It's, it's available. And for that price at the, for the community <coughs> garden, you also get uh, access to a tool shed. Each of the sites have tool sheds, complete with to tools, and that comes for that, that fee you pay. That's 60 to 100 a year? Yes, yes. The 
meat drop off those, you're getting a mixed bag of what kind of meat. Yeah, yeah, it's happening. not a. So it's. Yeah, you, you might not be the right acid. Or, um, and there's a lot of non organic. Uh, but it's still, it's a, it's a good source. A student sent this picture one year from her site that she had um, waited a year or two, but she finally had a community garden site. <coughs> this is down in the Whitaker community garden site where Nikki Maxwell has a raft garden and people that walk by and see her sign say, well, is there a boat involved in this? But um, they're also, that uh, group is also interested in maintaining uh, seed diversity. And she actually um, uh, uh, wraps her corn. She's really interested in maintaining the uh, a certain corn seed and also strawberries. Um, she has a, can't remember the name of a strawberry, but it's an extremely nutritious strawberry that doesn't travel well. So it slowly got uh, uh, not used anymore for strawberries because a strawberry farmer often wants to transport their strawberry. But these are really sweet and delicious. And she actually, um, uh, what's the process called, where she wraps uh, that corn for uh, several days um, while the silks are developing and the corn is pollinated because she doesn't want any crop pollination to occur. And this is something that um, she finds really interesting and is, um, uh, she has a lot of fun doing this process and it is another thing that is, uh, many people are finding appealing. I found this at the Cottage Gar Grove Garden site. They were having seed saving workshops also. Learn about gardening from our Master Gardener program, and LCC was uh, helpful in allowing uh, the Master Gardener program to stay here, even though uh, voters declined to support uh, an OSU uh, bond measure or, uh, that they were going for several years ago. So we do still have a Master Gardener program in Lane County. We need to keep going. Uh, there are gardens at schools. <coughs> and uh, as it has, has been mentioned, um, uh, we have a learning garden here. And they um, supply the, the bruschetta that you'll have a chance to taste as you leave. Um, the, the vegetables, the basil, and uh, I think tomatoes um, were supplied by the Learning Garden. And they're going to have a, a tour um, both at 10 and at 11 o'clock today. It's out by the child care centers. Wendy took these pictures. And when she sent me that one, we had just gotten our basil from our CSA and I just felt <coughs> like, you know, it was a, uh, I was smelling this picture. <laughs> and if you go on the tour, you'll get a chance to meet Julie. She just started this summer. That This was mentioned um, at the sustainability workshop yesterday. The Urban Farm um, has a class at the U of O um, that is, uh, was just featured in an article a, a few days or a week or so ago that you know, there's a waiting list of 300 students to take this class. Um, and you know, one thing that they were just doing um, is um, harvesting tomatoes for, pass, or for tomato pizza sauce that would be used in dining halls. Uh, garden at, uh, in Cottage Grove We really enjoyed our visit there. Gardens at Workplaces, it's out by Riverbend, where employees 
you know, during breaks, work the garden, harvest the garden. At the courthouse, it's uh, been a wonderful uh, garden over the past three years. They may have to develop that site. The future of it is sort of uncertain. And this is such an important thing to learn and relearn. Discipline, focus, what you do matters. Satisfaction of the job well done. We're always, I mean, we spend our life looking for opportunities for all of these things. Gardens at living places. <coughs> Sites like that, garden plots at Gapoa. <coughs> never stopped by there. It's, it's such a, you get such a good feeling seeing this sort of thing happening. And it's been happening for years. When we visited there, we, we talked to one person who had been gardening there, living there and gardening there for 15 years. And I think in her 80s, she was needing to, to stop doing it. But it uh, was very satisfying and rewarding. Food for Lane County has three garden spots. This one is out Coburg. They're making pizza with some of their harvest. They built the oven. They have a youth farm in Springfield, which is a gardening site, as well as a, a, a farm stand. And their third garden site is at Churchill, Churchill High School in Eugene. And one of the, the spots there is a Puerto de la Familia garden spot. And this was a, a, an open house or a, a tour, some sort of activity they had there uh, one summer that we went to it's in the garden. And they have expanded, Huerto has expanded to more self-empowering uh, uh, farming. And I th believe one of their major crops are uh, black-capped raspberries. And this is, a, so this is not where the garden is. It's for where the community, or the Food for Lane County garden is. This is another spot, a farm. And Food for Lane County is just um, uh, hiring a nutrition ed program coordinator. They just hired the person, and they're going to be uh, teaching this curriculum. And they're um, uh, trying to branch out beyond, be, beyond emergency food to more cooking and uh, nutrition uh, activities. And anybody who has gardened knows that you, um, you end up uh, producing a lot more than you can handle that week. You have to preserve. And this is a, a mobile cannery <coughs> at um, the Skinner, Skinner City Farm, which is a community garden site. Amazing. They bring that out to the garden, you know, on the bike. Food products made here. You know, one <coughs> thing we've had for a while now is Nancy's yogurt, and we uh, got some of their new Greek yogurt that you can taste as you leave. It's called the Springfield Creamery because it used to be there, and they're uh, be in Springfield. Now it's out by the airport, but there used to be creameries everywhere. And this is just down the street from where Springfield Creamery was. And I love it. The creamery is there on the right, but I just really like that picture. And our own local dairy, uh, Lockmead Farms has been there quite a while, and it's a big part of our um, family's culture, you know, walking down to the milk store, down to Dairy Mart to get milk. And I feel really good about drinking their milk. You know, they're, it's not, or, they're, what they feed their animals, it's not all organic, but it's very close to it. They use what I believe are very sustainable farming practices and they're, they branched out to growing uh, blueberries. These are grown on their farm, and I think they also do strawberries now. 
another local product, serrata tofu, tofu pate, they guess they removed the pate name and it's just now tofu dip. But we had that yesterday for breakfast at the, with the bagels you can get Toby's tofu dip. Uh, we have lots of bakeries but also products like uh, these burritos, uh, these uh, tortillas. Uh, wonderful local company, Honey Bee Food. They, they do a lot of good things for the community. A small, small cannery with glass jars. They can the tomato sauce our uh, farm has used. When they've had, this year they didn't have a good tomato year, so they're not uh, canning tomato sauce. But, uh, the sweet water is just down the street from them, so they do the do or down the highway. They're not sac city streets out there. And we have a long history of canning here. I mean, a hundred and hundred and ten years, and I can't find much of anything about the history of this cannery. I'm just so hoping we can. Uh, get the, uh, more information about a, a, a cannery that was here for 110 years and now it's just sort of, I mean, it's not part of our, what we know anymore. And this cannery was right where the, um, the, the and, and it's sort of disappearing from our, our history. The, uh, we, their library does have a video of their last sort of crop, but it doesn't have a lot of information on it. But one of the people they interviewed talked about how they canned fruits, vegetables, nuts, and uh, even ice cream and when you're cold, you know, which is uh, amazing thinking of that. We do have this um, uh, company, very successful company, but um, we don't buy their dryers um, for our home. You know, these are industrial dryers, but a really successful company. It, how many of you have heard of um, a commercial dehydrator systems? One, two, go, oh, good, good, good. I mean, it's, I had never heard of them until uh, recently. <coughs> but they've been here for a long time <coughs> in this area. Restaurants and institutions are offering local food, and not just our, our fine restaurant, so well, this is a fine restaurant, <laughs> but it's not, um, it's not uh, one of the big, it's a, it's a fast food place. Wonderful, wonderful fast food. And they feature uh, locally a lot of local products, local, local crops, local fish. And they not only uh, have the restaurant, but they sell products to, um, this is a, in our cafeteria, this is Corey, who the time I was interviewing Nancy Schwer there, he brought um, in their, um, their, their order. And I think they're a successful company. And Nancy estimates that about 20% of their, what they use is local, which is a, a great goal. If we could, everybody buy 20% local, it would bring so much money into our community that would stay here instead of that money going elsewhere. And uh, their canned beans, they weren't local Lane County beans, but um, they were um, <coughs> from a Salem company, Truett Brothers. And uh, she told me that day, I didn't know this, but they were, uh, she told me they're not going to be selling, and I think that was mentioned um, elsewhere this week, that they're not gonna be selling bottled water. Uh, unfortunately, they still have, from the nutrition standpoint, some of the products I would like to not see there, the big monster um, energy drinks, and things that, uh, but small changes. And we have, uh, we are taking part in this national campaign, Take Back the Tap. <coughs> I don't know if you noticed that yesterday. Um, because um, with, oops, oops, what am I going the wrong way? With, um, uh, local food, we also have wonderful local water here. We don't need to be buying our water in uh, 
bottles that add to the waste stream. Eugene gets it from Mackenzie River, Springfield from Wells. And this is, um, Gloria Vanderhorst told me about this uh, uh, new fountain right by the dance, dance studio. And for me to use this, I mean, for me, I'm basically one-handed and trying to press the button on a water fountain and get my water bottle under that, I mean, it's pretty impossible. I mean, even two-handed, it's sort of hard to get your, so this, um, this uh, fountain, you just set your um, water bottle on there and the water goes on. I mean, it's so nice. And it's, it's cool, it's uh, filtered, uh, it's expensive. <laughs> I mean, these fountains, you know, are expensive, but it's worth it. And I, I go, I go all over to to use this fountain. I mean, I I go from, you know, where we were eating yesterday for lunch. I went all the way over to this fountain to fill my water bottle because I really like that fountain. I think I saw one in the lobby of Building One too. Good, I good. I was wondering where, mm -hmm. and they have them at EMU. They have. Um, they're, they're, it's not the exact yeah, kind, yeah, but they're moving yeah, to this yeah, at. Cool. I'll, I'll watch for that one. Because um, because bottled water is expensive now. From a nutritionist, I don't like this message. That soda is cheaper than water. Yeah, yeah, the bottled water. Many of it comes out of tap water. So local stores, Newman's is probably our oldest still functioning store. I mean, I think it started in maybe in the 1800s. This picture was on the wall of Newman's because um, John Newman, I mean, selling it from a cart. And the Newman family, um, I know, no, we know his either granddaughter or great-granddaughter, Janet Heinemann still, she lives here. Long's Meat Market in Eugene is also an old establishment. This was a picture when they were, yeah, they used to be right uh, next door to Newman's Fish. I mean, they were in that market. It's now, I, it's always L&L &L to me, but um, yeah. Yeah. some other <laughs> name now. Um, and one of the reasons we do have access to local meat now, um, and these, you see these cows, if you go out to the wine, to our own Napa Valley, I mean, out um, to King Estate and things, you see some of these knee-deep, happy cows uh, grazing. Um, and one of the reasons we ha do see this more now is uh, mobile slaughterhouses. Uh, Animals are part of the fertility of a healthy farm. Not the only thing. I mean, you also have compost on a healthy farm. You have uh, green manure, you know, uh, plowing under the cover crops. Um, but they're part of the fertility. Uh, gra pasture raised uh, grass, pasture raised animals taste really delicious. They have healthier fats in them. Um, they have minerals, vitamin B12 as an aging. A woman, B12 is a, a little more of a problem, and it's uh, meat is a great source of support. Also milk, I mean, you don't have to eat meat, but um, meat um, in limited quantities, I think, can be part of a healthy diet. And the fact that pasture-raised uh, meat is more expensive means you don't scarf down a 12-ounce steak, and you can't afford to to buy it a lot, but it's a wonderful addition. And the reason they did this first mobile slaughterhouse on Lopez Island was these people were you know, raising cows in good, sustainable ways, and then they were having to truck them three and 400 miles to be slaughtered. And that's not why, how you wanna see these animals that you've lovingly cared for, you don't want them to spend their last hours in a truck. And so now these mobile slaughterhouses come to the farm and they uh, slaughter the animal there, take the animal away to be put into cuts of meat, but they also have a USDA inspector. And that's how they 
uh, ended up bringing these about because we <coughs> were able to inspect the meat. Chicken is a little harder to get year round. Um, uh, you can get it from Washington State. Longs gets the local chicken uh, during the summer fall season, but not during the winter. It comes from Washington. And this is local meat in Springfield, a store. I, I love the fact that uh, the first Dairy Mart, there is still a Dairy Mart at that exact same location there, uh, Chambers near uh, By Mart in Eugene. And they are really committed to um, uh, uh, healthier corner stores. They now, at a, the Rainbow and Centennial site, have a, a truck that brings uh, local produce. And I think it's just one, one afternoon a week, but it's a really a start at making uh, good food more available lots of different places. Grocery stores, uh, it's hard to, to find local food. Dean is giving me a no, I, I, so, I, yeah, we got a wrap up. We got a wrap up, okay, okay. Um, and this is a really nice uh, local, at least regional item, because uh, Flavor Pack is just, you, you, walk, you, you drive by those farms and the processing area, right, um, as you're going up to Portland. Um, and uh, local uh, grocery stores say when they get in local food, it goes right away. This is Albertsons. And um, this is something that I mentioned that any of you that want to look at more of a systems approach to local food, uh, access this document that I learned about at the Food Justice Conference at the U of O um, uh, a year and a half ago. They interviewed dozens of people involved with the local food system from um, organically grown to grocery stores to dietitians at WIC, you know, all sorts of people they interviewed and collected information. Okie dokie. Well, I'm done, aren't I? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.